songbook begins with the voice of wisdom. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So blessed is the man or woman who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or worse yet, sit in the seat of mockers. His delight is on the law of the Lord and on it he meditates day and night. And of course, you know what follows that, that wonderful blessing, that beautiful image of a tree planted by streams of living water, driving that root deeper and deeper and deeper to pull that living water up so that it produces the fruit that it's supposed to produce in season and its leaves never wither. That is the promise of wisdom that opens up the Psalms. The second Psalm, which is where we're going to be today, Psalm 2, is a mirror of that, but it comes at the topic of wisdom from a different perspective, from a royal perspective. But both of these Psalms speak about wisdom, about being wise, about being a wise man or a wise woman, whatever the case may be. And the wisdom that it talks about is anchored in God. It's not the wisdom of the world. It's not the smartest and brightest of the world. It is anchored in God. It is found in the word of God. And secondly, that wisdom has a purpose. It does not just make us smarter. It doesn't make us appear better to each other. It makes us holier. That's the image that we got from Psalm 1, the blessing of that man who is holy, who pursues, who pursues holiness, who seeks after holiness. The blessing of that man is the fullness of life, that picture we get in the tree. The contrast there is the contrast with the unwise, or we'll call them the wicked. It is the contrast of wise against unwise, of those who are pursuing holiness and those who are running from holiness, who have decided they are not going to be holy. Remember the way that they were described. The unwise are described as chap, without weight, without gravity, without anything. As the wind blows, they are blown about. They have no anchor, they have no hook to keep them in one place. Whatever way the wind blows, whatever the way the world directs them, that's the way they go. And the end of their life is they're simply scattered. They have nothing to hang on to, nothing to call their own, nothing that they can point to. They are just done. So it's clear from the first psalm that we want to be on the side of the wise and not wise. We're given the choice of two paths in life. And we all recognize these paths. We can choose the path of wisdom. We can choose the path of, of uh, is it unwisdom? We can choose the path of being the unwise. And you remember from the Sermon on the Mount, right? The narrow road, the wide road, the narrow gate, the wide gate. That's the contrast of these two things. The wise are going to choose that narrow road. The wise are going to be blessed because they're going to find their way to the narrow gate. The unwise, those who are kings unto themselves, are going to follow the broad road, the wide road that leads to destruction. So that's the first invitation into the Psalms. That is, as you open this Psalter, that's the first thing that it confronts you with. And it, that becomes the direction with which we read all the rest of the Psalms. How do I interpret this? What is this telling me? How do I apply this to my life? Because I want to be blessed. I want to be seen as, as one of the holy. I want to be seen as one of God's people. So what choices do I make? How do I interact with God? What is my relationship with God? You have the two paths. And time after time, you are encouraged to follow the godly path, the holy path, the path that God endorses. To choose the other path is unwise. To choose the other path is a bad decision. And that also is emphasized in the Psalms. 
When we read this, when we read it as an introduction and not just as the first psalm in the collection, when we get this, in, this, this introduction, it's an invitation to us. It's an invitation, obviously, to choose the right path. To choose wisdom because that's where blessing is. Not to choose uh, not wisdom. Not, not to choose being unwise because that leads to destruction. You don't want that. So we have that, that invitation. It's an invitation for us to trust in the God who blesses us. It is an invitation for us to put all of our trust in that God who is the source of that living water, who causes those leaves to come out and that fruit to come out. It is an invitation to trust that unlimited power of God. And it invites us to be disciples who disciple other people, who note unwise choices, who note when one of us is veering off of the narrow path and we call each other back. That is the fruit of wisdom. That is the benefit of us all pursuing wisdom. When one of us gets off track, we're there to pull the other back onto the track. Now you and I are reading the Psalms through different eyes than the original author intended. When this is written, right, we should read these first as Israel would read these. Israel opens the Psalms up and they begin to read these things, they're finding hope. They're looking for hope. They're looking to personalize the relationship of themselves and God. This is the purpose for which they do this. But what about us? Our relationship is different on this side of the cross. On this side of the cross, we know the hope that they're wishing for. We know what they're looking for. We know where their path leads. And so when we read these things, we look back and we look for Jesus. We look for Jesus throughout the Psalter. And whether he is not, he's not mentioned there by name, but when we look and we, we read from our side of things, Oh, that's referring to Jesus. Oh, this is talking about the Savior. Oh, this is pointing to the Messiah. We get the benefit of the same hope that they were hoping for. We now know that hope. That's the benefit of bringing our eyes to the Psalter. We find Jesus on every page. We find Jesus where he is. So we're going to read them as Israel, but we're also going to read them through our Christian eyes. We're going to bring both sets of eyes to do that. And that's where the wisdom comes back in. The wisdom tells us we have to read this as the original people would have read it, looking forward towards hope, because that's the way that it's written. Then we understand what it's saying. Then we can use it to, to build our lives, to shape our lives. Then the joy comes, then the, the smile comes, the lifting of our heart comes when we look back from this side of the cross and reread these psalms and say, yes, there's Jesus. Yes, there's the, the blessing that I'm looking for. So if you've got your Bibles open, let's go to Psalm number two. This is the second half of the introduction. And this is also a wisdom psalm. It's going to point us towards the heavens, much like Psalm 8, the first one that we read. But this is going to be, uh, uh, this is a, a little more mindful of, of God's power here. So I'm going to read all of Psalm 2 to you to begin. Psalm 2 to you. I like that. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will proclaim, this is the king speaking now, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. 
You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son, or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now the, the only regret I have is we didn't read this in Hebrew because my Hebrew is really bad. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? If you put this in the, in the proper dramatic voice, this is someone who is just amazed that someone would plot against God. They cannot believe in any way that someone would be dumb enough to try to plot against God, to try to lead some kind of rebellion, to be a usurper. That's our word for the day, usurper. They can't believe it. They are shocked at this. The, the picture I got in this, as soon as I read this, as soon as I began praying through this thing, I got this picture of this guy standing at the ocean, screaming at the waves to stop, right? Shaking his fist at the, stop! And no matter how long he stands there and screams at the waves, no matter how much he waves his fist at the waves of the ocean, there's no way that they're going to stop. There's no way. There's nothing he can do. He is that powerless against that force. And now take this image and the nations, the people, all the peoples of the word, world, plotting and conspiring against the creator God in heaven. Right? Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? It's useless. It can't happen the kings of the earth rise up. The rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointing, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. This is the usurpation that we were talking about in the garden. On a larger scale, millions of people now doing this same thing. Hundreds of kings, of leaders of the peoples, Rising up. We can be more powerful than God. We, we can lead ourselves. We have all the power. Where is this God of heaven? Where is he? He's powerless. I'm the king of this. And that goes all the way down to the individual person. I'm the king of my life. I can live however I want. I can do whatever I want. And what is God's response? The one throned in heaven laughs. He laughs. Can you picture that? The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. All these powerful kings, all these individuals are saying, I'm the ruler of my life. I'll do what I think is right and God will just accommodate that. God will just go along with that, whatever it is. I rule over all these people, however many people it is, whatever. And God is just up there laughing, laughing. We don't often picture God laughing, but he's laughing. He is openly mocking all these usurpers on earth. God is openly scoffing at these human kings who think they have any power at all that he didn't give to them, who have any power over history that he doesn't allow. He's just laughing. He's looking down into history at these kings who think they're so powerful. <laughs> He's just laughing at them. He said, why? Why are you doing this? But then he stops laughing. Then he stops laughing. And he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, if I could turn my page, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Now look at the foreshadow we're getting, right? Now, 
Israel's hoping for this. Israel's looking for this Messiah. Israel's looking into the future. Yes, yes, God is going to put his king on Mount Zion, on the place of his people, on the temple where his people live. God is going to put his king there and everything is going to be great. Everything is going to be perfect. And all these other usurpers, they're going to be under this king. This is going to be so great. But look at us, look at us. We're on this side of the cross. And we're looking backwards and we know who that king is. We know who that king installed was. And listen to what the king says. I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. That means this king, this Messiah that God is going to give, this anointed one of Israel, this promise that they're all looking forward to, it's going to have the hand of God on him. He's going to be blessed by God. He's not going to be a human king. He's not going to be one of these fallible, usurping kings. He's going to be a holy, human king given by God for the good of God's people. And they're looking forward for this hope. They're looking forward for this. Listen to this, verse 8. Ask me. And I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Yes, this king is going to come. This king is going to come, and he is going to be king over everybody. Now imagine that if you're Israel, you just want a king that's over you. You just want a king that represents you. You'd be perfectly happy with somebody like David who would come and be this king and be the best king they'd possibly, you'd be perfectly happy with that. But God says, not even close. I'm gonna send you a king who will be king over all the peoples, over all the nations, over all of humanity. That's the king that will come. That's the king that we find in the Christ. He will have God's power. He will have God's blessing. And he will be wise. Now look at this little image in verse 9. You have to go back to Egypt to understand this. In Egyptian tradition, in the temple of a god, they would take little ceramic pots and they, they would write a city's name on that little pot. And then they would, they would go to the, the temple for that, that, that idol, that, that made-up king, and they would put that pot in there. So in this little temple to Ra, let's say, all these little pots had the names of all the cities that he owned, that, that were a part of his domain. Okay, You got the picture? Little room, idol god, little pots with all the cities, um, Named on. But if another god took over that city, then one of the priests that was allowed to go into that temple room would go in there and smash that pot because it was no longer part of Ra's domain. So that's the picture that the psalmist is pulling here that from, from the, their neighboring area. They're, they're pulling this image full. They're saying any city, any city that doesn't fall under my domain, any unwise people will be destroyed. They'll be destroyed. They'll, like chaff, they will blow away. So the promise of the king is all the blessing and any danger, any people group that doesn't be, uh, doesn't become subjects of this king are gone. Are gone. Look at the next verse. Therefore you kings, this is to the earthly kings, therefore you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. And here's the recommended behavior. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling for his wrath I'm sorry celebrate his rule with trembling and then this illusion going forward kiss his son 
that king that was just mentioned there, or he will be angry. So pledge your allegiance to that king. You see the wise, unwise path. The unwise path is to continue in your rebellion. The unwise path is to continue to plot in vain against God. The unwise path is to choose anything other than pledging your allegiance and serving this king. The wise choice puts you on the right side of this king, makes you a part of the blessed people, makes you where you want to be. Kiss the son, this coming king, or he will be angry, and your way will lead to your destruction. So the unwise choice, the choice to not pledge your fealty to this king is going to lead to destruction. And if even for one moment a person is tempted to say, well, I might be able to think up something that can overwhelm this God. It doesn't say here, but I'm sure there was a footnote in the original. Go back to the beginning and reread this again. No plot you can come up with, no idea that you can dream up, no power that you think you have is going to be sufficient for you to overcome God. Make the wise choice. And then finally, blessed are all who take up refuge in Him. Now as you're sitting here today, you have probably made the wise choice to worship the King of Kings, to pledge your allegiance to God. And if you haven't, we should talk after service. So I'm going to go on the assumption that, that you've all done that, right? And that's a wise decision because it puts you in that group of people identified as the people of God. It puts you in that family of the wise people. It puts you in the family of those who have a promised inheritance. You have all these blessings, right? And your, your wisdom, your wise decision, in both Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, your wise decision gives you an invitation for you to be a part of God's redemption project, of his reclamation project, of him leading around that circle back to the new heavens and the new earth where everything is going to be set right. It's an invitation in that wise choice you've made to become more wise, to become wiser and share that wisdom with others, to disciple others into that. Now, the temptation for us, just like the gospel conversation we've been having, the temptation for us is to process all this stuff intellectually, to let it just rest up here in our head. We say, okay, well, what's a wise decision? Make a list of pros, a list of cons, and then make my decision on that. But that's not what the Bible is recommending here. Remember, the Psalms speak heart to heart. And what God names as wisdom, what God says will drive wise choices is your heart connected to God's heart. It's to have that personal relationship, that conduit of relationship so that your decisions are not anchored in what you think is right. Your decisions, your choices are not anchored in, in, in what the world has taught you is right but in what God says is right. Bless you. That's where wise choices come from. So the invitation is not just to know this, not just to make a list of it, have a little notebook where you write these things down. That's not the invitation. The invitation is to be this, to be the wise one, to be wisdom in your circle of relationships, to be wisdom to your family, to be wisdom to your children, to be wisdom to everybody that you come into contact with. You look at the circle of people that you encounter and the countless opportunities all of us have to show wisdom to other people to be wise, to help them see how their choices are good, how their choices are godly and holy, but maybe how their choices are leading them to destruction. And the connection 
that we want to take to it, not just an intellectual connection. You know, if you've talked to somebody who's doing something wrong, they've, they've chosen the wrong path, they've, they've, chosen, they've made bad choices, and you know if you come to them and you speak head to head, right? And you give them a list of all the things they need to stop doing, all the things that they should change about their life, what's their response? You know what their response is. Yeah, thanks. No thanks. But, but, when you come up to a person in relationship, and you go from here to there, from here to here, you bring your wisdom through that connection. It's a whole different story, isn't it? Listen, I'm coming to you, not because I think I'm smart, not because my behavior is any better, not because of any of those things, but I'm coming to you because I love you, because I care about you, because what I see in your life is leading you down an unwise path towards destruction. So I'm not going to tell you what choice to make. I'm not going to tell you what the right or wrong thing is. What I'm going to tell you is I love you. And I care about you. And I'm willing to pour all that I am into you to help you find your way out of this destructive path you're on. And that's the recommendation that we see in both of these psalms. When we read these from that perspective of wise, unwise, when we read these as poetry, as psalms, as hymns of love, then it becomes here to here. It is our heart connected with God's heart. It is our heart connected with the heart of another person. That's how we share that wisdom with other people. I, I was sharing with the Sunday school class, I had this beautiful, blessed opportunity to talk to a couple of members of the Watchtower Society yesterday. That's the Jehovah's Witnesses. They made the mistake of knocking on my door and I, I jumped on it, okay? But I didn't sit there and tell them they're wrong. Well, I did, but I did it lovingly, okay? But here's the thing. I just led them through the, their understanding, and then I showed them in the Bible where the proper understanding was. And I told them this two or three times. I said, listen, your heart for evangelism, your willingness to go out and spend your time doing this, that is spot on. That is, that is God honoring for the right God. And I'm telling you this, because I want to honor what you're doing. I want to honor your devotion to God. I want you to find the true God so that you can apply this same devotion, this same willingness to walk up to strangers and give them your idea of the gospel. I told them that I loved them and that I cared about them and that I wanted them to find the true Christ. Now, had I just said, you're dead wrong, take your devil worship someplace else, it wouldn't have done anything for them. That would not have spoken into their life. But because I recognize them as image bearers, I recognize them as human beings made in the image of God who have been misled, who have been misguided, and all they needed was somebody lovingly to tell them to come back my prayer in approaching things that way was that it would plant a seed with them. I was telling the class that three of their sisters were camped out over at my neighbor Brenda's house waiting for this conversation to end. I was kind of, hey, come on over here so I can tell all five of you here. But when we communicate that way, when we tell people things that way, we tell them that in love, we connect heart to heart. And we've talked about outside people here, maybe people who are not yet God's people, but the same thing applies to us. When we speak to one another, when we, when we correct one another, 
when we express our concern with choices that one another are making, we do so heart to heart. It's one thing to sit and say, you should stop doing, you should stop doing this, young man. Monty's never done anything so long. But you should stop doing this. Well, that's one thing. And then the other person can hear it and go, well, what makes you so smart? Or I've seen you do the same thing. Or whatever it is. But instead, we, the people of God, we who share the image and the Holy Spirit, should speak to one another from here to there. We should speak to one another from heart to heart. Listen. Listen. I see your life headed this way. I see the choice that you're making going this way. And because you're my sister, because you're my brother, I want to speak to you from here to here. I want to bring some wisdom into your life. What a difference that makes. What a difference that makes when we accept the invitation of these songs to speak to one another like that, to show the hope that we have like that. So we started this morning with the blessing of the wise. Blessed is the man. We start this morning, we come into this psalm, and we see the same thing. We see that man, blessed is the man who does not walk with the wicked or align themselves with sinners or, worst of all, camp out with mockers. And we say, well, none of us would do that. Yeah, I hope that's true. I hope none of us would do that. But there's a million different ways that that can find its way into our life. And it's all of us together that keep each other in that blessing, that keep each other away from those things, that keep each other on that narrow path. What follows in Psalm 1 is meditation on the law of the Lord. It's taking this psalm and reading it again and again and again and again, not just to read it, not just to sit there and say, okay, I read it, I read it, I read it, I read it. No, stop and ask yourself, ask the Spirit, am I one of these who's plotting against God? Am I one of these who's plotting in vain against God? Am I one of these who God is laughing at, is scoffing? On his law, he meditates day and night. And the result of that, my friends, though, is the result of us sharing heart to heart, the result of us sharing heart to heart with people that are not God's people, is that it creates in us and it creates in each other those roots that go down, that drive down, that anchor us to that living water, to that stream of living water that nourishes us, that builds us, that, that cares for us, that, that helps us to endure. That's the blessing. That's the blessing. And in both of these songs, we see models that we can build our lives on. We see examples of things we should do and things we shouldn't do. And so our song today, our song today comes to this conclusion, this, this blessing for all those who will follow the God of wisdom, all those who will give their allegiance to his king. And it says, blessed are those who take refuge in him. Blessed are those who pledge their allegiance to him. Blessed are those who find their hope and peace in that king. Blessed are those who locate their lives in and with that king. Blessed are those who know the hope and the promise of eternity in his presence. And blessed, blessed are those who know all these things, who trust all these things, because the God that is promising these, the King that is promising me, is the God Almighty, creator, sustainer of the universe. Blessed is the one who finds refuge in the Son, in the Father, in the Spirit. Blessed is the one who knows, who knows that God knows your 
name. That God speaks to your heart. And that God, this God, is the one that blesses your life. Amen.